Lawrence Friedman's uh, Strategy History by Oxford Press, 2013. Um, continuing with the section Planners, page 502. So we just finished with the Whiz Kids. The Whiz Kids got the company on the road to recovery. That is the Ford Motor Company. So McNamara emerged as the leader of the group, the group, the Whiz Kids, and on November 9, 1960, the day John F. Kennedy won the uh, presidential election, he was made president of Ford Motor Company. Within two months, however, he resigned to become Kennedy's Secretary of Defense. We've already noted uh, McNamara's impact on the Pentagon as he imposed forms of centralized, analytically based control. We can now see how this fit in with developments in management theory. It was telling that McNamara's predecessor at the Pentagon, Charles Wilson, who served President Eisenhower, had also come from the same industry. Wilson had been Sloan's successor as president of General Motors and had run the Pentagon on the M form basis, seeing the individual services as separate divisions and the assistant secretaries in charge of each service as his vice presidents. As Eisenhower was determined to hold down defense expenditure, Wilson's tenure was marked by intensive inter-service rivalry, which he struggled to contain. The individual services worked independently from each other, with much animosity and little coordination, fortified by their friends in Congress and, and industry. McNamara's approach was quite different, more ANSOF than Chandler and Drucker. His aim was to get a grip on the process by strengthening his office, challenging the services to justify their budgets and programs in the face of intensive questioning by the, his whiz kids, largely brought in from RAND and gathered in the Office of Systems Analysis. This aggressive analytical approach had a major impact on the management of U.S. military programs and the conduct of operations, particularly Vietnam. Whereas at first McNamara was celebrated as the exemplar of the most modern management methods, by the time he left the Pentagon in 1968, his approach was derided for his, its relentless focus on what could be measured rather than what actually needed to be understood, criticisms that McNamara in, in later life accepted. In corporations, as in government, whole departments were established to develop the plans, working out in meticulous detail the steps to be taken in their appropriate sequence. Planning cycles came to dominate corporate life, with everybody waiting for a formal document that would tell them how to behave, setting out budgets and programs with warnings of the danger if they went off plan. Politically, the consequence was to strengthen the center at the expense of alienating those responsible for implementation, who were apt to become cynical in the face of meaningless targets. The matrix picked the strategy, one executive exclaimed in frustration. The matrix can implement it. The long-range forecasts upon which they, de they depended were inherently unreliable, and the organizational information was often dated, collected haphazardly into inappropriate categories, and taking little account of cultural factors. Even Ansoff became concerned that the structures he had initially advocated risked paralyzing decision-making and came at the expense of flexibility. One of the economists uh, Friedrich Hayek's most famous papers uh, put the central problem of planning for a rational economic order as, quote, the knowledge of the circumstances of which we must make use never exists in concentrated or integrated form, but solely as the dispersed bits of incomplete and frequently contradictory knowledge which all the separate individuals possess, end quote. The problem set by no knowledge was not one that a single mind could solve in order to allocate tr resources, but rather how to secure the best use of resources known to any of the members of society for ends whose relative importance only those, uh, only these individuals know. Or to put it briefly, it is a problem of the utilization of knowledge which is not given to anyone in its totality. Writing 25 years later, Aaron Woldovsky uh, commented on the vogue for planning at both national and company levels. The intensely skeptical Wodolsky, Wildovsky noted the lack of evidence that the process had any value. At one level, all decisions were forms of planning 
as attempts to improve on a future state of affairs. The success of planning depended on the ability to control the future consequences of present actions. In a, in a large corporation, let alone a whole nation, this meant controlling the decisions of many people with different interests and purposes so as to secure a premeditated effect. Some casual theory, some causal theory, must connect the planned actions with the desired future results and then the ability to act on this theory. The more people and types of actions involved, the greater the demands on the theory as it had to explain how to get all to act differently than they would, uh, than would otherwise be the case. By the 1980s, strategic planning was losing its luster. The planning departments had become large and expensive. The next cycle began as soon as the previous one finished, and the outputs were ever more complicated. Evidence of past difficulties and failures were assessed not as symptoms of a flawed system, but of too much independent thought in the course of implementation, requiring even more prescription and explicit budgets and targets. The break came with General Electric, a company famed for and apparently proud of its elaborate planning system, decided to abolish it completely. Complaints were reported about an isolated bureaucracy relying on dubious data instead of market instincts, persisting with incorrect predictions because they lacked the flexibility to change course. Senior executives were at the mercy of the process with no alternative to the grand plan. Meanwhile, as General Electric's new chief executive, Jack Welch, observed, the books got thicker, the, the printing got more sophisticated, the covers got harder, and the drawings got better. Welch was said to have been impressed by a letter in Fortune in 1981 that criticized the endless quest by managers for a paint-by-numbers approach that would automatically give them answers. Drawing parallels with Clausewitz and von Moltke's senses of battle, he observed that strategy was not a lengthy a action plan. It was the evolution of a central idea through continually changing circumstances. Any cookbook approach is powerless to cope with the independent will or with the unfolding situations of the real world. Welch embraced this approach at General Electric using von Moltke's aphorism about plans not surviving the first contact with the enemy to explain why the company did not need a rigid plan but instead a central idea that could be adopted that could be adapted to circumstances. In 1984, citing General Electric, Business Week announced or pronounced the end of the reign of the strategic planner with few achievements to its credit and many disappointments. The coup de grace was delivered by Henry Mintzberg in 1994 with his book The Rise and Fall of Strategic Planning. In 1991, in response to an earlier article by Mintzberg, Ansoff complained that Mintzberg seemed to commit all prescriptive schools for strategy to the garbage heap of history, adding sadly that if he was to accept this verdict, he had spent 40 years contributing to solutions which are not useful to the practice of strategic management. In the business world, as in the military, the loss of confidence in models based on centralized control, quantification, and rational analysis left an opening for alternative approaches to strategy. These centralizing models had fewer shortcomings in theory than they turned out to have in practice. They set out to uh, they set out an ideal of how a chief executive might operate, but this was based on heroic assumptions about how optimal decisions could be made and then implemented. In particular, it was a model for the powerful, a superpower country, or even a superpower corporation. As the environments became less manageable, the cumbersome process the model demanded became dysfunctional and unresponsive. Alternative approaches required a better understanding of how to cope with conflict within and between organizations. By and large, economics helped answer the questions on the horizontal axis regarding developing strategies for competition, while sociology assisted with those on the vertical axis about how to get the best out of an organization.